Ja gotovo nočen horosho po ruski. So the rest of my presentation will be in English. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and thank you guys for taking time out of a conference that offers pretty much everything uh, to find out what Amazon has learned about a really great way, actually a very consistent way of increasing customer engagement and therefore retention through competitive games. Now, what I do, I have the best job in the world at Amazon. I get to fly around the world and talk to rooms full of developers. And one of the things is you guys tell me is what's not working for you. And I go back and tell the people in Seattle at Amazon, they need more downloads, they need more retention. And Amazon thinks about it. And every once in a while, they come back to me and say, hey Mike, we figured something out. Here, take this data back to them. We want to share some stuff. And that's what I get to do with you guys right now, talking about competitive gaming. So first of all, I want to just make sure that we've made the connection between competition and engagement, because that's important. And we're not the first people to think about this or figure this out, actually. Professionals in um, business science, I mean, the IEEE has papers on competition and increasing engagement. Educators have figured this out for schools and classrooms, that increasing education increases student engagement. I mean, even consulting companies, the bottom one here, even they figured out that you can get more employees engaged at the office by adding additional uh, engagement. Now, Competition is also very, very powerful <clears throat> when it comes, people, comes to getting people to spend time on a task, particularly in gaming. And I want to play a little game with you guys. It's kind of audience participation, so join along if you like. I want to talk about how many hours people spend, how many, people, how many hours people spend um, on various tasks. So how many million hours do you think it took us to build the Great Pyramids of Giza? Does anyone have a wild guess? One million, okay, that's sort of close. It's actually 33 million. I mean, archeologist's best guess, plus or minus 100%. I'll give you credit for 100 million, so, so thank you for that. Um, the most popular video on YouTube has actually changed since I put this slide together. It used to be um, Gungam style, you know, Gungam style. Um, it's still a dance video, but now it's a Latin American music video that has almost 300 million hours of views. So, I mean, that's a lot. The most watched YouTube video, that's a lot of hours. But let's start talking about competition. And not even a global competition. Let's talk about a competition just in the United States and not even a professional United States competition. How about a college basketball tournament? We call our national college basketball tournament March Madness because people go crazy over this. And not only do they go crazy over it, they spend about 640 million hours watching it. Wow, okay, competition is attractive, but let's combine competitions and video games. How many million hours do you think people spent watching games on Twitch? Um, billion was a lot closer. Actually, 4.8 billion, to be exact. So, competition, really good. Competition and video games, there's a lot of attention being paid to games out here. So, this is great data to have. Um, how does it work? on a per game level. I mean, never mind all of the cumulative data. How does it work for an individual game? Well, I'd like to share that with you too. Uh, we worked with Nuzu. They're a company out of the Netherlands that does a lot of research into esports. And we had them take a look at a competitive game for, uh, for three weeks. The week before they held a tournament, the week during the tournament, you can guess which week that is, yes, it's the one in the middle, and then the week after the tournament. So the week before the tournament, they baseline things at 100%, and then they took a look at the social engagement increase that the tournament had. And just holding the tournament created a 150% increase in Twitch views. 
That's that big, tall blue graph um, uh, right in the center there. And notice that that kind of trails over into the week after the tournament finished as well. So that's nice. Engagement is good. But does it result into any improvement in the bottom line? I mean, really, we need to keep the lights on and we need to keep our developers fed, right? Well, this is good because we also saw a 100% or sorry, we saw a 50% increase in downloads for the game just because they were holding a tournament. There were no additional sales, there was no additional marketing outside promoting the tournament and people engaging in the tournament, sharing it with their friends, 50% more game downloads, and does that result in anything in the bottom line? 25% higher revenues during the week of the tournament. So there's a concrete evidence that having competition results in increased engagement, which results in increased downloads and increased revenue. And even the week after the tournament, you still see a lot of these good trends um, continue. There's a little bit of a dip below 100% um, for, uh, for downloads, but revenue stays pretty strong uh, for the couple weeks afterwards. So you can actually see a lot of individual benefit in having a competition in your game. Now, competition in your game. Um, there's a potential for this to get confusing. I mean, what is a competitive game, really? If you don't have an esports title, is any of this actually relevant to you? Well, yes, it is. And we did a little bit of research into that as Amazon, because certainly when I was listening to the team talk about this, I thought competitive games were esports titles. You know, League of Legends, uh, Counter-Strike, um, you know, Global Operations. I thought it was all esports titles. And when you ask people if they're competitive game players, they think about these titles. So most people, when, they a when you ask them, they'll say no. But it turns out, a competitive game is any game that lets two or more people compete with each other in the same context. Yeah, tic-tac-toe and other, other similar games. And when you look at the games people play, almost all of us play competitive games, whether we say we're competitive gamers or not. And I mean, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? I mean, competition has been kind of with us as humanity for a long time. I mean, even games like chess and go, right? They've been popular for centuries. <laughs> and not because they've got really good user acquisition campaigns either. No, it's because there's something fundamental about competition. So we actually worked with, again, we worked with Nuzu and we dove down into what things make you go from just a regular game to a competitive game to an esports super title. And I'd like to share some of those steps with you. Um, at the very bottom is kind of a core game. And to, you know, the number of games that start out as a core, let's go ahead and index that as 100. Maybe 1% or less than 1% will make it halfway up. And even smaller than that will make it to an eSports powerhouse that actually has live in-person events where people will pay for tickets to sit down and watch you play. Most of us are never going to reach that level. Let's be serious. We're not going to have stadiums full of people playing our games. Well, or at least not my games. However, that doesn't mean that we can't achieve considerably more success with competitions than we've got right now. The first part is actually recognizing that you can compete with each other. Even if you have an endless runner, it can still be competitive, finishing the level in the shortest time, finishing the level with the fewest power-ups, finishing the level um, with the most jumps or the fewest jumps. There are all kinds of different ways that you can compete on how to finish a game in an endless runner. So you do have the possibility to compete in your game. More about this later. And then if you can find a way to compete, it's got to be beyond just a leaderboard. It's got to be something that, that you can share. It's got to be something that can help motivate people or that people can take advantage of. And so we pop up the circle a bit to where I've got the yellow highlight. I know it's a little bit small to read. <laughs> Actually, can anyone read that? <laughs> maybe, maybe a couple people in the front row can. Um, it says that uh, facilitating and, and simulating the creation of leagues and competition between friends is key to both mobile and PC competitive games. Wow, M mobile games too? Well, yeah, I guess if you're going to count, 
casual games, like tic-tac-toe is a competitive game, why not mobile, kind of the king of, of casual games? So this got us thinking. What if we enabled competition in casual games on mobile? What would happen? So we did that. We had a few casual games that we put on our, our, our tablets, and we took them to shopping malls, and we gave them to people who were coming by, and people, when they found out that there was a competition, would actually stop what they were doing and play the games. You wouldn't believe how many moms in Southern California think that they are the best at match three games. A lot of them. And literally, this one woman parked her cart with her child sitting in the cart and made the kid wait there for five or ten minutes while she reset a high score on, I think it was a match three game that we were testing. So, yeah, that match three game got a lot more minutes of usage and a lot more sessions than it ever would have had there not been that competition. All right, this is good. It's time for us to take this to kind of the next level and see how far we can go. So we decided we were going to set up a casual mobile esports tournament. <laughs> and we got NBC, a major television network in the United States, to broadcast it. Okay, these guys that you see up here, they're playing, they're playing Pac-Man on mobile devices. Okay, that like epitomizes casual mobile games. And people were engaging. I mean, millions of people tuned in to watch this thing, to watch people play Pac-Man on mobile devices. And it was amazing what we discovered. Everything that you get, every benefit that you have from competitive games on PCs at the highest level, you get from casual games on mobile you get increasing return on investment of your game, and uh, particularly on your marketing dollar, because people are playing your games longer, more ad impressions, and they're having more sessions per month. They help grow your community, because people now talk about upcoming competitions, strategies for competitions, how well they did in competitions, and no small amount of, ha ha ha, I beat you. Um, but I mean, it's all good in the community, right? Um, and it keeps your players coming back. One of the neat things we discovered is that when somebody doesn't win, what they do is they figure out why they didn't win. They take a look at the strategy used by the person who won, and then they spend more time in the game trying to figure out how they can improve as well. That's additional hours, that's additional engagement, and that's additional retention for you guys. Okay, so this is great, and it turns out that this is, um, you know, Pretty interesting. Now, if all of these benefits are there for competitive games, even casual games on mobile, why don't we see more of them? All right, that's a good question. It turns out none of the major frameworks or engines make it easy to add competitive moments, particularly to casual games like, you know, um, uh, Endless Runners or... Um, you know, platformers, not necessarily really well suited for what you would think is PVP competitive play. So we saw a business opportunity. If we created a tool that made it easier for you to create competition in your games, would that actually work? So we tried it. And in March at GDC, we released a set of APIs, the REST APIs. Uh, we call it Game On. And it helps you do all these things. Okay, never mind about all these things. If you care about it, take a picture of the slide because I'm not going to read all of that stuff to you. What I want to focus on are just three things that are really important that we found from the people who have been using these APIs. One, it's really easy to create competitions, particularly when you as a developer actually don't have to do each one of them. What you do as a developer is you set the victory conditions in your game, and they can be some really interesting conditions. I'll get to that soon. And then you've got a dashboard that your marketing manager can run so that you don't ever have to recompile or resubmit anything. Your marketing manager can take care of all that. What was really powerful was letting your fans, letting your players decide who they want to compete with and when they want to compete. I mean, if you want people to engage more, you got to facilitate them engaging at their level, at their space. So you can imagine a handful of friends gathered around 
any one of the booths here and thinking, well, you know, I'd be really good at that game. Well, no, I'd be better. Really? Okay, let's do it right now. Let's play. And they can create a local competition with three or four people um, limited to your friend group. And this is pretty neat if you've got a friend group that maybe isn't the best at a particular game. You can compete with people who you know who are like you. And that will help them set up more competitions more frequently with their friends. Extend this a little bit. If you can do that with a friend group, your streamer, or anyone who streams your game, can do that with their subscribers or their followers. Nice. Imagine if you're a streamer and you can set up a private competition just for those people who subscribe to your stream. And now all of your fans can play the game against you and try to beat you. And they can watch you suffering mightily as you try to beat the high score on the Twitch stream. That is a fantastic opportunity, not just for you guys, but for your streamers as well to encourage them to stream your game because it gives them this ability to work with their audience. Really powerful. Last thing is, as a developer, you can actually set up a game to work within the context of, say, a game conference like DevGam. And we've actually done just that. I'll get to that in a bit. Um, it is popular with more than just casual games, though. Um, certainly Power Rangers, we've got um, millions and millions of scores submitted for Power Rangers. Gear Club is a really good racing simulator. It's a pretty core racing simulator. Uh, and we're really happy to see that the competitions that people can set up in Gear Club work really well. And they also work well for even the most casual games, like Ostrich Among Us. All right, it's a silly little game. You see those four ostrich on the right there? They dance, they go up and down, they go sideways, and because they're ostriches, they stick their heads in the ground. Now, you're the fourth ostrich with the hat. You need to follow the lead of the other ostriches. Sounds simple. It's actually remarkably hard. <laughs> it's one of these fast fail games, and they keep doing trickier things and faster and harder. And my high score is like 47 or 48. So it's kind of a flappy bird kind of experience. And we've turned that into a competition that all of you can play here at DevGam today. So if you actually go to the, um, uh, your app store, your favorite app, oh, I have a little video of this. Um, you, you can see how cute they dance. Um, it's really not that easy, but moving on. Um, you can actually go out to the URL here, ostrichgame.com, and find links for uh, Android, for uh, Amazon App Store, for, for Apple. Download the game, and you'll see a tournament button. If you've got good bandwidth, you'll be able to see the tournament button. Click on the tournament button, and you'll be able to enter the game. Now, to make sure that we're restricting it to DevGam, you need to enter the password. So guys, take a picture of the password. Yeah, okay, the only time I really like people having their phones out. So take a picture of the password. It is case sensitive. But uh, to give you some added incentive, uh, you can actually win a reward for being in the top two. At the, at the DevGam Quest raffle, we're going to award some prizes for the people who finish in the top two. And the developer has also offered some in-app purchase things to award you if you actually finish um, uh, in the top five. As a matter of fact, it lets you give any of your in-game purchases away to winners um, uh, for, for your game. So that's pretty cool. Now, from the games that have implemented this, what have we learned? Well, we've, we found two different kinds of games. Direct competition games where your actions immediately affect the action of the person you're competing against, like fencing or tennis, like uh, Leeds of Legends or Hearthstone. There are also indirect competition games like archery, downhill skiing, the guy who skied before you doesn't affect your ability to ski well or poorly, and like Ostrich Among Us, your ability to dance with an ostrich um, doesn't impact my inability to dance with an ostrich. They do have different kinds of competitions that work well though. For direct competition games, league play is good. Now, up until up until recently, the most common way to rank players in player versus player or league play was a leaderboard, a high score. That's great, but it's not optimal. If you want to find out who the best competitive player is, don't you want to know the person with the best win-loss ratio? 
That makes more sense, doesn't it? And if you're going to send someone to a, you know, a playoff game uh, from your league, don't you want to send the guy who's got the best win-loss ratio in your league? Well, with a good structured competitive experience, you can pick any kind of win condition, particularly winning conditions that are going to impact and matter to your audience. So let's think of, um, um, we're going to talk about a match three game a little bit later, but think about how you do that. As a matter of fact, we'll go ahead and talk about that now. An indirect competition. Um, think about winning conditions that help people enjoy the game that they want to play it. Let's go back to match three. I'm really good at doing match threes quickly. I'll have a billion moves, but I can win a level in relatively little time. Uh, I know someone who doesn't do very many moves, but gets a whole bunch of very good combinations uh, to beat the level in a little bit longer time. Now, these are both valid ways of getting high scores, but they're very different ways of playing. And you can set up competitions that reward each kind of player in your game. So someone who's having trouble setting a high score might say, hey, I'm up for the speed challenge, or I'm up for the combo challenge. And this gets more people engaged in competing in more aspects of your game. So think about different kinds of victory conditions that would make it possible for more of your audience to enjoy and explore your game. So those are the two really big tips for uh, direct uh, competition games. Make sure you have a win-loss ratio. And then for indirect competitive games, find different kinds of quests that, that meet different kinds of players' needs. Now, in the United States, Amazon can even award real-world prizes to people who compete with each other. For most of the world, you can reward in-game purchase items if you want, or just status. But for your players in the United States, you can choose to sponsor an award of any item sold by Amazon. So that's kind of a cool thing that you might want to offer for your players in the US. Don't spend over $35 on an award. In all the testing that we did, we limited our rewards to about $35 items, and we got fantastic um, participation. So you don't need to spend very much in order to have an award be really valuable. Um, I'd like to wrap up by kind of going back to what the people who don't win get out of this. And Nelson Mandela really did do a good job of, of nailing this closed. Um, he never loses. He either wins or he learns. And that's the kind of experience that good competitive gaming experiences can bring to your audience and to your players. And I hope you do that. Uh, whether you use our tool set or somebody else's tool set, um, it's a fantastic thing. So enable your community to have those competitions. Make sure that your streamers create competitions for their followers. It's good for your streamers, and it's going to be good for the health of your game and for downloads. And sponsor regular competitions. You saw the one game I showed you. Guess what? That was a mobile title. So make sure that you have competitions at least once a quarter, once a month maybe, once every couple of weeks might be overdoing it a little bit. Um, but that's something that you can absolutely do today. Um, I used to have a bunch of these books here at our booth. They used to have a bunch of these books at the Apodil booth. All the books are gone, I'm sorry. But you can still get the PDF uh, by coming and visiting the URL uh, down here. It's just got more information on the Amazon App Store. And what I'd like to leave you with is just kind of the last little nugget on how we developed Game On. It's a set of REST APIs, which means it works for anything that has an HTTPS connection. It'll work on PlayStation, Xbox, Switch. It'll work on Steam, PC, uh, Mac. It'll work on Android, iOS. So uh, hey, feel free to check it out and learn more by going uh, to the URLs up here. Uh, if you want to have a longer conversation, I'd be happy to do that with you. Either connect with me on social media or come visit me at the booth. Guys, thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate it.